Welcome to the Costa Property Podcast, the podcast that turns your dreams of owning a piece of paradise on the Costa del Sol into reality. I'm Glenn Maloney, and I'm joined by my co-host and wife, Sandra Maloney. If you're dreaming of your perfect Costa del Sol home, wondering where to start, and want to get real, no frills, expert advice, then you're absolutely in the right place. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome to the Costa Property Podcast, episode three. Today, we've got a super special guest coming on board for you all. I'm really excited about this one. We're actually diving into the topic of all things visas. I don't know about you, Warner, but, you know, I hear a lot of confused people when they start to see the topic of visas being explored. It just causes a little bit of panic. They tend to feel overwhelmed little bit scared. What do I do? Where do I go? Absolutely, Sandra. It is a minefield. And I hope this episode clarifies a lot of interesting facts about the visas and what the people need to do in order to get the visas correctly. Okay, so it's time for Warner's word of the day. Okay, because it's 24 degrees outside today and the sun is shining, the Spanish word for today is sol. What does sol mean? Sol means sun, and we have 325 days of sun per year, Sandra. Such a privilege to live in such a beautiful, beautiful place with such a lovely climate. Our very, very, very special guest today is Regina Martin, who is a residential property lawyer from benamadnalawyers.com. And Regina, mm-hmm. very, very special welcome to episode three of the Cost of Property podcast. Thank you very much for having me. We are super happy to have you with us today, sharing all your knowledge. I was talking to Warner about, about you last night, and this is a good one for our listeners. I think you're probably one of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable, not can't speak English today, knowledgeable mm-hmm. people I know. And like, how many languages do you speak, Regina? Um, English, French, German, and Russian. But I can make myself understand. I don't know in the amount of, in any language almost. I find a way to make the person understand what they need to know. I think that's incredible. I have, I've, like, I'm always so envious of people that speak so many languages. It's, it's really <laughs> such, a, such an amazing gift. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about you. Well, I am Spanish from here, from here. <laughs> I am I was born in Fuengirola, my grandparents Marbella and Estepona, and my other grandparents from Malaga, my parents from Malaga, Malaga, Malaga. So we are really Spanish, but my father was very modern and he had me in international school since I was in kindergarten. I went to San Anthony. Um, my life has been the life of Costa del Sol with everyone coming and seeing all the changes and mixing with everyone. And this is why I speak so many languages. So mm-hmm. you've really seen like the evolution of the Costa del Sol over Absolutely. the last number of years. Mm-hmm. And tell us a little bit about that from, from your own lens, from your own eyes. Whereas when Durola was a fisherman's um, village, quite poor, my father was the chemist. There were mm. other chemists, but we were in the one of the in the main uh, square. And uh, when I went to the school in the morning, I would go through the fishermen places, and the ladies were in black, with completely mm, because someone had died, and they were all mm. blackish all around. The men were all in the sea and they were sitting in their doorsteps and they were all called Maria, all of them. All and Maria. then were all called Pepe. <laughs> that was <laughs> it. And suddenly there was an English school. We started having friends from all around. My grandmother was amazed because English ladies, old English ladies in their thirties wore pink uh, blouses and yellow blouses. And how could they not be in, in black like very, everyone else? <laughs> Things became very, very colorful and uh, I found it very enriching and yeah. also the people the children of these fishermen instead of going to the sea they would go to the sea and also have restaurants and they became wealthy and 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 very very happy so the the coming of british and many other people from all around made this a a very rich area 
not only in physical wealth, but also in, in, in sensations, in knowledge, in relationships. Yeah, mm. it's incredible. So tell us about your business. Well, I was, I started in Menalmadena in 1992. I started uh, my office here because I wanted to give service to um, international clients. At that time, there were more British clients. Um, I thought it was near from the airport and it was a very lightful village and uh, I liked it very much. So I came here when I was a small student, a, a girl, I saw that all my friends who were not Spanish were speaking about their parents having so many problems with papers. <laughs> and I thought, well, well, I can earn my living by doing papers for these people. And that is what I do. Amazing, Regina. So you, you saw a gap immediately, you know, that there was a, definitely a need to help people with mm -hmm. their paperwork. And, and who would you describe as your most common customer? Well, at first we had most of them British, mm -hmm. as I had many friends that were from the school and then from my acquaintances. So I did have most British. Then Irish came. We also had German and French and, and uh, all parts of Europe uh, clients also. In the um, uh, year 2000, we started having Russians coming around very little at first. In 2008, we had a lot of them. Then they disappeared. <laughs> yeah, they are there, but not so many. Now, many people from different parts of Europe, like Hungary and, uh, and Czechia and uh, Poland, who are starting to come, and they are so in love of the Costa del Sol. Mm -hmm. And of course, Scandinavians. And we have many clients now also from the United States and Canada. So it's a melting pot of, uh, of people. And what type of things do you typically support them with? Are they usually like buying a property here or what mm -hmm. do you, yeah, that's the most. My common. main work is helping to buy the property, mm -hmm. sell a property, also inheritance, things to do with property. Really, I am a property lawyer, but people come and I am their link many times, uh, Warner, when we work together also. What you try is you try to be their contact with the rest of the area because they don't know anything. So if they need a plumber, if they need a school for their children, if they don't know how to organize their papers in order to live here, the NI number or the residencia okay. or taxes, I will be telling you how to organize so that they have a start. Property work I do is key in hand. Mm -hmm. That is, mm -hmm. they come, they say, I've seen this property. And then the next time that I see them, or I explain everything along the, 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 the time, but I give them the key and I say, okay, your electricity is in your name, your mm -hmm. town hall things are in your name, the property in the registry is in your name. Mm -hmm. Go for the sofas. So really supporting them through the whole process mm -hmm. of, you know, purchasing their home and what they need to think about and being a, an amazing support partner for them. It's very important. The human factor is very important, right? Yeah. It's not so much papers or internet. You have so much information. But when someone is nervous, they need to hold a hand. They need to okay. see, mm, know that, yes, that is it and not all the information they found in the internet, that it's good for them. It's such a big, big journey, you know, hmm. in terms of making that step or following that dream to mm. purchase a property in another country where in many cases they often don't speak the local language. So mm -hmm. it can be definitely daunting. So almost you know, all well, times. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And do you find that a challenge, Regina, when clients don't speak Spanish or or what's your view on that? I don't expect a person to understand or even want to learn Spanish if they come here, because this is a multi-international area. If you are English, you can live all your life in English and you don't need Spanish for anything. Maybe to say hello and goodbye. You don't need it. No one is going to expect you to learn, especially British or, or English speaking people, because for some reason you leave it or you, you let it be. They, they won't, they won't learn. Yeah. But uh, most important, if you are Swedish, you can live your life in Swedish. If you are Finnish, you Finnish. There is no problem. More important for me is that people understand the steps they are taking, that they understand what they are doing, right? 
that if they are going to sign a paper, they understand that paper. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. I see, if I understand or, or speak the language, I will answer, I, is, explain it. If not, they'll have a translator uh, translating mm -hmm. it. It's not that I want them to understand bureaucracy, but I want them to understand their own papers. Whereabouts they are. If someone asks, where are your deeds? To know this paper is my deed. This is it. And here is my name, the price I've paid. So I want people to be comfortable. People get confused about the different visas. What are the most common ones? It's normal that they get confused because there are many kinds of visas. There are many kinds of possibilities to come into to Spain to live, right? Very common are the golden visa for those who can afford it. Also, I like to mention the student visa because anyone can ask for a student visa. Even if you are 80, you can ask for a student visa. And then a visa that I find that is the most common for my clients because they are coming normally to retire in this area is that non-working resident visa. It allows you to, to live in Spain, to, to go around all the Schengen area. It does not allow you to work, but it is a good starting point, even if you are not retired, to enter into Spain and then after a year, you can move it, you can change it into another kinds of visas, right? Many people come to retire and then they buy a property in Spain, for instance, and they want to be here more than 90 days each time. So they ask for this non-lucrative or non-working visa that allows them to stay the whole year if they want. That would be really for the British client, wouldn't it? Because of the it British. It would be so perfect for the British, but it is also for other people from the Canada, from United States, from Egypt, from Turkey, from anywhere, any person that is not from the European Union, right? That wants to come to live in Spain more than 90 days each time, right? More than half a year. Huh? then they need to have it. To start, you need not to have the non-working non visa. You need not to be a citizen of the European Union. Because if you are a citizen of the European Union, you don't need it. Also, to anyone, for any visas you ask, it's very important that the 90-180 rule is taken into account. When you are going to ask for a visa, you need to be legal in Spain. So if you are here more than 90 days without a visa and you are not from the European Union, you are considered to be a kind of illegal. And they will always look at that first in order to organize your or to give you your residence, even if it's a, a student visa, a golden visa, whatever kind of visa. So very, very important when you come into Spain or in the Schengen area, don't be more than 90 days in the Schengen area, right? Or in Spain. And uh, make sure that when you come in and go out the Schengen area, and especially if you are going to ask for these documents, stamp your passport that you can see it with good ink. If they don't do it very clear, tell them to do it clearer. Even if you are coming, for instance, you are entering the Schengen area through Italy and you are then coming to Spain, ask for this stamp, ask for it. We need to show that you've been less than 90 days in the area. That is essential, okay? Once you are not from the European Union and you are legal because you have not too many uh, too little stamps in your in your passport then you need to show you need to see where your domicile is for instance if you are from oxford you would need to show you are from oxford and you would belong to the um, consulate of london the spanish consulate in london right you need to ask for the non working visa in the nearest spanish consulate you cannot ask for it directly in Spain, like the student visa or the golden visa or other visa. You need to do it in your country. So you need to show that you belong to that consulate, to the area of that consulate. 
and that with your proof of uh, address, there are ways to do it. If you might even be a student in London, well, to show that you're living in London and then you are studying there and uh, to show that your domicile is there in order to go to that consulate and not to another consulate. You get the permission in your own country first. You file some documents, I will say, in your own country. After that, you get a letter saying, yes, you, you are able to, to have the, the residence in Spain. And then you come to Spain, you have a month after getting the letter authorizing, you will come to Spain and ask for your resident card. Uh, lawyers will be able to go through all the process with the person so we can organize also the file that is done in, in the Spanish consulates around the world, right? You need to first ask for an appointment in the Spanish consulate. It's not complicated. It really is not complicated. Ask for an appointment and prepare a file. That will be, you will need about three months to organize that. Okay, one, one question then. So if I'm, say, British and I go to the consulate in Spain, do they recommend a lawyer wherever I'm moving to Spain? Or do you have to get, connect with a lawyer wherever you're going, i.e. Malaga? Okay, uh, there are, maybe they will recommend a lawyer or if you are moving to, a, to Spain, and you have a real estate, they will recommend a lawyer. Or if you are renting a property, you can ask. There are many, many uh, lawyers and legal assistants that can help in this matter. It's an industry almost. There are many people working here to help people to come. And it'd be very good for the economy, the more people that come to Spain. They want people. We want, we want everyone to come. We rely in our tourism and also on in our residential tourism. It's richness for the country. So we do try to help as much as possible and to make it as easy as possible, right? So when you decide that you're going to move into Spain, you plan a little. And I would say that first, I, would, I always tell my clients, know your documents. If you're going to move to another country, Get a folder and put in all your essential documents. You're going to move with your family, birth certificates of your children, marriage certificate, your own passports, everyone's passports. The passports to ask for the residency need to be valid for at least one year. You cannot come with a passport that will expire in 30 days or in two months. You need to have a passport that will be a lasting passport, at least for one year. At the consulate, you will need to ask for an appointment, which it's not complicated. You enter the web of the consulate and you ask for the appointment or you ask your lawyer to do it for you. And then you will need, when the appointment comes, to present a folder with some documents in. And these are not complicated documents. To ask for a non-working visa, you will need to show that you have, that you can earn your living out of Spain because you won't have the, the possibility to work here. So you need to come with your money. Um, the amount needed for one person per year, so the first time you ask for the non-working uh, visa, that you will need to have 20, uh, 29,000 euros in your bank account for the first person and 7,200 for the ne next members of the family, right? So if it's two people, uh, 36,000 euros would be okay. You can show it in different ways. You can show your pension, you can show assets, income, but you, the best is to have a bank account in Spain and to show a certificate proving that you have that money sitting in your account. That is the easiest, the, 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 the best way to do it. Right? It's only one document, a certificate that shows that you have money for one year. For instance, then, a British person, retired British person, been to Spain on holiday and decides, okay, I want to go to the sun. Um, so he would have to go to the consulate. In regards to bank accounts and everything else, 
when does he start to open his bank accounts and how does he start to open the bank accounts? Okay. I imagine if someone wants to move to Spain, they will first come to explore a little, right? And before applying for the residency, I imagine they will decide where to live. Where are they going to stay? Not in Airbnb, right? So I imagine they will try to find a rental property for a long-term rental property. Most of my clients buy a property, right? So when they are in the process of buying the property, they should tell their lawyer, I am going to also apply for my residency. And um, at that point, they will get an NII, they will be opening a bank account, they will be putting some money into it, and they will start preparing. It's not that you think, I am going to get a residency and ask for an um, appointment at the consulate without a plan, right? If you come as a tourist, you can also enter into any bank and open a bank account. You can do it. You can open a bank account only with a proof of address, a, a proof of income like your P60 or your pension and your passport. And with that, you can open a bank account and hold in the bank account the 30 uh, something thousand euros needed to prove your capacity of keeping yourself without working. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic information because a lot of people are confused because of Brexit. Brexit. Mm -hmm. They're thinking that they can't come to Spain anymore to live. Um, mm -hmm. But with the non it look the visa that gives them an option, you know, live their retirement years and the and the sunshine. There are many ways, many different visas. This is why people get confused, but really what it is is that it's every time easier and easier to come to live to Spain. Because if you don't enter into one, you enter into the other. Everyone that is legal in the way know that you have been no more than 90 days, right? And that you, I mean, other of the papers you need is that you don't have a criminal record. You need a certificate for a criminal record. You need a certificate that you don't have a special business that will make everyone sick in Spain. That certificate is very easy to get in any uh, Spanish doctor when you come for holidays or at your uh, doctor, your PG, general practitioner in, in the UK. Um, there are not so many more things you need in order to request for it. Having sufficient money to keep yourself if possible, having a, a property already or, or having somewhere where you're going to live, a medical certificate, the criminal record, the proof of income, and then, of course, your passport, okay. your identity, your passport, your wife, children's passport. If you're coming with children, you need, and you know it, you need to organize the schooling. You need to have already chosen a school and know that to have a certificate that the children will be going to a school, that you have a place to put them in. Okay, so the non lucrative visa, it doesn't need to be for like people that are going to retire. The non lucrative visa can work for any, any family as long mm -hmm. as they have the money to support themselves. Mm. A typical thing would be um, uh, the family stays in Spain and the father stays, but goes sometimes, or mother goes sometimes to te telework most of the times and sometimes flies to their country to do the physical, the, the personal meetings. And uh, if they are not, uh, if they are um, uh, earning their, their life out of Spain, they can come without the problem, bring the children. They need to prove that they don't need to work in Spain that they have sufficient income. And also they need insurance, right? But I know, for instance, the English use the S1 form and it is accepted in Spain. So the social security of many, many countries can be brought to Spain and it will be accepted as you are covered by your own social security. Okay, that's very interesting then, because I thought a lot of people had to have health insurance mm -hmm. um, in regards to, obviously, you know, people from the UK 
um, they lost the right after Brexit so for the health insurance to be mm-hmm. paid by the state of Spain, for example. Mm-hmm. Which they can have, there is one form imported, brought into Spain. They can have a, a there are many health insurances that allow people even 70, 75 to have an insurance, a health insurance. So really, and it's not very expensive. So I think it works getting information when you when you want to move, not just be afraid because there is Brexit for the British. We are speaking not so many, there are not so many differences with before. And because there are different kind of visas and the, of, of resident cards and different ways to come, it's important to know the person and to see which are the circumstances of the person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because maybe they they cannot get, maybe they want to work and then a non-working visa that is mm-hmm. called is good for them. Maybe they should start with a student's visa and then change into another one. I mean, there are different ways of coming. Mm-hmm. The one that people, if everyone could have it, would be wonderful is the golden visa. Mm-hmm. And, and what is what is that then? What does that say? The golden visa, really, it's not a visa. It's a, a resident card with your photo on it. It's like a passport that you get. As being a resident in Spain, it gives you the opportunity to travel all around the Schengen area, to stay from one day a year to the whole year without stop, if you wish. It allows you to decide if you want to be a tax resident in Spain or if you want to continue to be a tax resident in your own country and come just less than six months a year, right? You can choose all of that. And for that, you need to buy a property or several properties for more than 500,000 euros. Okay. It looks a lot of money, but Mm -hmm. more people than you think would be able to buy Mm -hmm. to make this kind of investment. Sometimes people buy one property for themselves and one or two smaller to rent out Mm -hmm. so that they have a pension plus two other incomes. And it's really not complicated to make. It's really easy to do the documents once the person has done the investment. Okay. So essentially, like there's no age criteria on this visa. It's essentially if you have 500,000 euro to invest per person. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so if there's a family of two, it's if that is a family of two, you need mm-hmm. to do the investment in only one name. There are exceptions, but mm-hmm. in principle, for British, I am thinking about British at this moment. Under the English law, each of you have personal assets. The assets of one person don't mix with the assets of the other person. You have your own assets and your husband has his own assets. Mm-hmm. In that case, only one person oh, can have the asset of the 500,000 investment. If you are a digital nomad, there is mm-hmm. a special visa for the digital nomads that now are very much in demand. Mm-hmm. These people buy a property here, they for most of the year and they telework all the time, right? Yeah. And they have this kind of visa that is for three years and doesn't need to show so much money. So it's really also quite interesting. So most important is to tell your circumstances to the yeah. real estate, to the people, to your contact people, explain what you want to do, have a plan. It's mm-hmm. it's more yeah, it's not buying a property, it's having a plan, a life mm-hmm. plan. And Regina, when it comes to the process for applying for the different visas, like what type of timescales are people looking at? The most complicated thing that comes sometimes is understanding how to ask for the appointments. Mm-hmm. For instance, in the consulate, because the ones that are asking for these non-lucrative, that is non-working visa in the different consulates sometimes, especially the one of London, they are booked up and they will give you an appointment maybe in two months. Mm -hmm. So it's not as fast and then there are several months to, to do it. So if you are going to plan to come under that visa, it's good. It's always good to buy the property and then start coming because then also you can show your commitment with the country, right? Mm -hmm. And they will look at it. We would say several months, but the golden visa, 
can be as short as 20 days. The longest I have had was two months. Mm -hmm. But that was not a problem because once you are filing it, the person can stay. The nomad visas, they can ask for it while they are here and it's quite fast also. I feel the student's visa, you have a certain time to do it. It's uh, less than three months. You should be also be able to do it. Come, ask for it, and you should be able to to prepare it before your 90 days are finished. So actually, you know, from point of appointment to point of application process is pretty fluid. It's pretty fast. Depending uh, on the kind mm -hmm. of a resident card that you are asking, it will be mm -hmm. shorter, it will be longer. Sometimes there are no appointments and the, the person that is going to take care of your file will know how to do in order to get the appointment faster, right? Mm -hmm. But but it's not a, a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's more the black legend about documents in Spain, really yeah. the bureaucracy. It's more a black <laughs> legend than what it really is. Do you, do you feel it's a black le legend? It's unnecessary bad media to Spain. Is that your opinion? I think that this is Latin, that <laughs> we are... <laughs> In a Mediterranean country, and if you look at uh, all the Mediterranean, uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, uh, all the north of Morocco, what was the Roman Empire, right? Mm. They invented the laws. They invented the kind of world we are living in now. They, they started the democracy, right? But they started the bureaucracy. <laughs> and my language and my way of, of, of doing things is Roman. Yeah. You are from the north of Europe. You have common law that is super fast. That is a complete different con concept. But apart from that, I think that we have a, a, a way of doing it that also works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you are coming to Spain, you relax. <laughs> that start. Yeah. Then you, you plan things well and you get someone to help you. And then yeah. there is no problem. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know everything. You need to know someone that will be able to help you. I think that's a good point, you know, that don't expect that it's going to be done the same as in your own country because mm -hmm. it's a different country and there's different approaches and mm -hmm. different ways of doing things. Just a question that came to my mind that I'm curious about as, as you were uh, speaking through the visas. You know, I think we've spoke a bit about the approach, you know, mainly for Brits because, you know, we have seen traditionally a lot of Brits in this part of the coast. But, you know, is there, if somebody was in America or they were listening from the States or they were mm -hmm. in Asia, do, is there different things that they need to think about? No, the same. No. Amazing. Hmm. It's the same. same. In fact, the British are being treated now because they are not in the European Union as everyone else out Sorry. of the European mm -hmm. Union. It doesn't matter if you're from China, from Canada. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Okay. You simply will be... Um, uh, 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 coming and your documents will be the same either from the United States, from Canada, from the United Kingdom. No problem. No, it's the mm -hmm. same. It's the same criteria. From the Arab countries, from name it. Uh, Regina, in the news today, there was reporting that France has um, relaxed the law of 90 to 180 days for British citizens, mm -hmm. which is uh, property portal Quiero has said there's been an a demand of 900% up looking for properties in France. Do you think mm. Spain will do the same? Well, um, I think this is very important. I was expecting that in 2024, we wouldn't be speaking about visas for, for British people. Mm. I didn't imagine because I was speaking to you about this this morning. We have Europe and we have the European Union, right? The European Union is a, an agreement with, between countries that are inside Europe, but Europe is geography, mm -hmm. it's culture. And England, Scotland, Wales, it's Europe, right? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. same as Norway, the same as Sweden, the same as, I don't know, Swiss country, the same as everything. Mm -hmm. So I, you cannot treat Norwegians in a way, mm, British in another way. I mean, it's Europe. And I think that it will come to an end all this all this story about about residencies for for Europeans Europeans, right? So so by having France stepping 
into the matter, I would say that Spain should go immediately after because mm -hmm. we cannot lose the opportunity mm -hmm. to, I mean, uh, Costa del Sol, half of the people, more, it must be three quarters of the people are not Spanish. I mean, you, you need to, 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 to give a solution. So watch this space to see if very soon the trend follows France, right? Mm -hmm. I would say it must be 2024. I cannot imagine other thing at this moment after France has done it. And Regina, from your point of view, if somebody was listening at home today and, you know, their dream, you, you, see, you see this a lot because you help people make their dreams happen. You're part of the process with them. Their dream is to purchase a property in Spain, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're aware now, okay, I'm going to need to go through a process of a visa. What would you ask? What would you advise them to start thinking about now? When they are wanting to organize their visa mm. and uh, buying their property also, and well, they need to choose where they want to go. And then I would organize very well my documents, my bank documents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would get, uh, if you have money in different places, put them in one account so that it's easy to show what is the wealth you have, right? Okay and organize your P60s or your pension documents and put everything together in a little folder so that when you come, most of the file is already done, it's economic. You need to show that you have sufficient funds to come without being a burden for Spain, without costing money to the Spanish system. Mm -hmm. So you need to show you can earn your living or you can pay your living. Most of the visas, you will need to have a health insurance and this health insurance for the golden visa, a health insurance that will cost about 1,000 euros a year, depending on the age you have. And sometimes you can use the insurance from your own country. Okay. Your health insurance from your country, you can bring it into Spain and then it will help you. Mm -hmm. So depending, depending. But get all your, all the documents you would need in your own country to ask for a mortgage or for any official papers. You put them together. That's it. So start getting organized, start gathering. Mm. Many all people the don't even know where they have their telephone bill. I don't know. <laughs> so put things in a folder. That's it. Gather things <laughs> together. And in PDF, not with photos. <laughs> yes. That's very true, actually, in PDF format. So start getting organized, start thinking mm. about the different types of documentation you would need if you were starting your process of visa application, mm -hmm. gathering everything together. And Regina, what do you love most about Spain? Spain. I, I like Spain. I like very much the way of being of the Spanish people. But anyhow, I'm Spanish. What can I say? <laughs> I like, I think it's really cheerful. When I was the, when I was a student, I would go to other countries, and when I saw that at six o'clock people would start starting putting their pajamas on, oh, and they would look at TV as everything they one could do in life, I I became I, I would become very depressed because here life starts after work, right? It does. Um, in the morning we work, so it's not that we don't work, but. I think it go it does it has something to do with the weather. We are in the south of Europe. We are in an extremely sunny area where in January we have been able to go and swim in the beach several days and most of the times I mean today be, below this I have a short I have a, a, a something with short I don't know how you call it short not long leaves because yeah. it's not cold it's uh, so that makes people go into the street. Perfect. That mm -hmm. makes people want to see and speak with other people. And uh, it makes the streets cheerful. Yeah. And when you see other people smiling, then you smile and you feel good. So it's totally true. And what you say there about the pajamas at six o'clock, you would really hate to come to my house because that's mm. me <laughs> in the evening, pajamas on. I haven't, I haven't integrated no, much life fully. Yes, I still mm. like my pajamas at night. Nowadays, I think <laughs> different. Nowadays, I think, but before, but it, I think this is very, every life goes 
out of the home, right? I did we this. are very, very much, we go to have lunch. We don't need to spend a lot of money to have lunch mm -hmm. because maybe we ask for a, a tomato with salt and mm -hmm. some olives and a beer and that's what we have. I mean, yeah. you don't need to spend a lot of money, but you're sitting. Yeah. In the in, in, in a nice bar in the middle of the street with a small thing in a plate and a beer and with a lot of sun and you feel rich. Yeah, I totally agree. To me, this is this is the perfect place to live. You know, the mm. culture is phenomenal. It is such an outdoor lifestyle. And I also feel for kids, they spend so much time outside, which is just so healthy for them. Mm. And you know, they're outdoors integrating. And what's your favorite season in Spain? All seasons. Oh. I like all. <laughs> I like all. I like the winter very much because it's sunny. It's not hot. And uh, I love going into the beach when there is not so much going around, right? Simply to walk, I feel like alone. Then there are many more people, but it's like, marvelous and also because I feel that it's a privilege mm -hmm. in the summer everyone is having the sun also in in Germany but <laughs> in January I feel honored it's such a lovely way to look at it it's so true it's so true mm -hmm. it's such an it's such an honor and we think that sometimes when we see people on the beach and it's not a very very hot day and we, we have our jackets mm. on and they're swimming in the mm. sea we forget they've probably come from minus 16 and degrees in the north of Sweden so this mm. is like summertime for them and absolutely it is a privilege an absolute privilege Sandra that happened to you when you came back from Denmark you, you left mm. here at 22 degrees and you went to Denmark at minus 16 with snow it was a shock to the system yeah, absolutely. So it, it is a it's an absolute privilege, as Regina says, in terms of being able to experience mm. that in the middle of in the middle of winter. I had a, a client from Finland and he would tell me that when he would go to his countryside uh, house, it would be three hours, no, five hours with in a in a traffic jam in order to get out of the city and to go and minus twenty two. <laughs> yeah. And then he will get a plane, come to Malaga, five hours, four hours, plus 22. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Regina, it's been incredible to talk to you today. And thank you for sharing all of your wonderful knowledge with our listeners. And if our mm -hmm. listeners at home would like to get in touch with you, how do they do that? I have a webpage, uh, www.benalmadenalawyers.com. Maybe you can put it mm -hmm. in written. Yeah. And also by telephone or by email. And um, I will be very happy to help. Amazing, amazing. We really appreciate you sharing all of your all of your knowledge and insights. It's been wow. it's been a pleasure. Thank you to you. Thank you so much for listening into today's episode on the Cost of Property podcast. Another fantastic episode learning about the highs and lows of relocating to the Costa del Sol from real people who have been through the journey themselves and of course our wonderful experts. If you have been enjoying the show so far, remember to hit subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating or review. We absolutely love hearing your thoughts. Please send any questions that you would like us to answer on the show to Warner at wlcostaproperties.net or you can pop us a message on our socials, which are in the show notes. Remember, you can also visit the website www.wlcostaproperties.net. See you on the next episode and bye for now. Bye bye.